corporate candy floss news and no political spin. This is Truth Radio by Internet. Thanks to our sponsor, Nemewell.com, because here, the expression is still free. Tuesday the 1st of November 2005 and it's a world exclusive because today is the public internet launch of a new book which rips away the veil of history to show you the world in a totally new light. It's a stunning mind-blowing revelation and you're in for a treat because the author is joining us here on The Next Level on BreakForNews.com. Push me on to the next level. And this is Fenton Don reporting. Thanks for joining us. Thanks also to our sponsor, Neemwell.com, your personal source for potent Indian neem, which is a secret in most of the world, but it's not a secret to the half a billion Indian people who use it on a daily basis for their health needs. You can get the full story at Neemwell, N E E M W E L L.com. And we're a pretty seasoned, hard-nosed, journalistic bunch here. But a new book came across my desk in the last few weeks, one which is being released publicly on the Internet today. You can check out the website returntotara.com. Tara, T-A-R-A, returntotara.com. That's where you can find details on this book, Ireland, Land of the Pharaohs, by Andrew Power. And it would be a good idea to bring up that website because you'll find graphics and illustrations there which will help you to follow the discussion we're about to have. The book's available at the website right now for purchase by International Airmail. It's an astonishing achievement. It's a mind-blowing trip through history. But it's not just a history book. It puts all that in a context of what's going on in the world today, politically, socially, economically. It's hard to believe that one book can shed light on so many different areas ranging from the true location of Noah's Ark, the fate of an ancient civilization right across to the Illuminati and the secret societies whose traces we still see in the political events around us today. But this book does. Some of the topic areas we're about to discuss you may be familiar with, but you've never heard them brought together like this. So sit back and relax and open your mind, close the curtains, get rid of the distractions because we are about to go on an incredible journey. And our guides on that journey, a journey they've already made themselves, are joining us right now in studio here on The Next Level on BreakForNews.com. And you're very welcome back. You're on the next level on breakfornews.com. And I'm joined here on a windy and a very gusty evening by two gentlemen from the other side of the border here in Ireland. That's Northern Ireland. And they are Andrew Power and Irvin James. And you're very welcome both. Yeah, good to see you. And Thank you. Uh, and good to see you guys too. And of course, being from an Irish uh, Catholic and therefore nationalist background, where's your horns? <laughs> I left them at home and the cloven feet and stuff <laughs> yeah, I left them at home uh, maybe this is long overdue Andy mm. you've looked into the history of all this where the ancient battle the battle of the Boyne 
which has been something that's divided Catholic and Protestant in Northern Ireland, fits into a bigger historical picture. Mm. And the results of examining that picture are astonishing. Well, the, the research covers about 30 years. Uh, most of the, the physical research was done five, ten years ago. Five, ten. You've been a willing accomplice as well, Irvin, in helping to turn over every rock and stone in the Boyne Valley. Yes, <laughs> not always easy. <laughs> uh, but we, we've had a lot of experiences down there and uh, very rewarding. Right. Well, of course, it's it's no surprise that uh, there's an interest in the Boyne Valley because to clue in listeners who aren't aware of Irish history and the significance of it, we might as well, well cover what happened down in the Boyne Valley and happened a long time ago, mm. back in 1690. Yeah. It was a clash of two forces. What were those forces and what were they clashing over at the time, ostensibly, on the surface? Yeah, on the surface, it was uh, a religious battle between mm -hmm. James of the House of Stuart and Prince William of the House of Orange. But then again, these two houses were very closely linked, uh, James being the father-in-law and uncle of William. So it was like a family b battle, you know. In a way, in and a yet way. in another way, it represented a battle between power systems in Europe at yeah. the time. What yeah. were those two power systems and how did James and William line up on either side of those perceived power structures? Well, William was... Uh, Suppose the Protestant Northern Europe, Holland, Dutch, or James was backed by the, the Southern Europeans, the Vatican. So uh, it was a power structure actually of the city of London and the Vatican. Uh, William representing the city of London eventually, and James representing the Vatican. Yes. Uh, as, um, as power structures, not yeah. as, as religion, as power structures. Yeah, and even leaving the religion out of it, where you had uh, James on the Catholic, in a commas, side, and, and William on the Protestant side, there have been some interesting financial changes which had taken place in London around the time of William, and which William represented. Mm. It was, it was the rise of the boys we know so well today, the merchant bankers, if that was the moment that they, in effect, mm. seized power of the monetary basis. Mm. Well, actually, the seized power in 1666. Mm -hmm. I think this is where the 666 thing comes in as yeah, well. Yeah. And in 1666, Charles II was on the throne. As it, it turned out more of a figurehead mm -hmm. because uh, uh, a law came into being in 1666 called the British Banking Law. Yes. The Charles II. This, in effect, gave the private bankers the authority to print money and put it into circulation. And this is the start of, of another cycle of this control, this uh, debt-based control. control is it? This really is like an earlier version of what Americans would be very familiar with those who have studied these matters, the Federal Reserve Act. Yeah. This was the beginning of a fiat currency, exactly. which had taken place in 1666. Yeah. And now by 1690, we have William ostensibly lined up against James mm. in Ireland, yeah. uh, not in England, so this is mm. some kind of a power thing, but it's not happening in the United Kingdom, mm. it's happening over in Ireland. Mm. And we have William to the north, and we have James to the south, mm. on the banks of the River Boyne, yeah. about halfway up Ireland. Yeah. And they come to meet each other there for what is a battle. Supposedly. Uh, supposedly, yeah. A battle which then, in recent years, has fueled the sectarian divide. Mm. What you're saying is... There's something much deeper going on. Oh, here. much deeper. Uh, it was, in, in fact, a Horus ritual. Horus, Osiris, which is an e Egyptian, Egyptian ritual. Ritual. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, people are going, hold on a second. Uh, Egypt uh, is Egypt, yeah, Ireland is yeah. Ireland. Uh, what are you guys on about? Yeah. Well, what is this about? Because there are these lodges, orange lodges, mm -hmm which are almost, I would say, a semi-Masonic. Uh, yeah. It's very like the clubs in the United States. Mm. These are lodges along the same kind of lines. But they have divisions and sections. One of those sections is the Black Preceptory. Mm. Sounds absolutely fine. What's the longer name, though, of the Black Preceptory? The Royal Black Knights of the Camp of Israel. The Royal Black Knights of the Camp of Israel, mm. which doesn't really sound very Irish to me. There's <laughs> something... <laughs> And yeah. even in some of the banners which appear at these celebratory marches on the 12th of July mm. to celebrate this battle, we see very interesting symbols being mm. used in those banners as well. Yeah, well there's actually two, I mean you'll see uh, symbols 
on, on the Orange Bombers on the 12th of July. It's completely different symbols on the Black Preceptory mm -hmm. Bombers, usually on the last Saturday in August. August. Right. It's usually called Black, Sat Black Saturday. And those give the, the most clue, the Black Preceptory give the most clue of what's going on here at a deeper level. At a deeper level, yeah. Because it's mostly about Israel, the camp of Israel. You know, different scenes out of the Old Testament. Yeah. And, of course, this isn't totally unfamiliar territory. It's been explored to a degree, and some people will be aware of issues like Tia Tefi, and mm -hmm. whether Tia Tefi came to Ireland, etc. And they'll also be aware of the stone under the throne, the coronation mm. throne in London, and what's the origin of that stone. So some of this area has been explored. Yeah. You're taking it right back to the Battle of the Boyne, mm. and saying that the battle represented not just a battle, but actually a Hor an Osiris Horus ritual. Yeah. One of the reasons that you might be onto it there is that the Boyne area there on both sides of the river isn't just famous because of it, it played this role in 1690 and it has mm. been a source of sectarian division in modern era. It's also famous because it's the site of one of the most astonishing and well-preserved megalithic structures mm. in Europe, known as an area as Newgrange in particular. Mm. They were having this battle, and how far up the road is, mm. is, is, are these ancient monuments? Mm. A stone to throw? Yeah, that's so, a good name for first clue. I was standing uh, just outside the New Grange uh, megalith and I was looking down towards the Boyne I thought, my goodness William and James fought a battle down there, it was the first time I was ever there I thought, well, what's that why, you know, why did they come to this area, and as soon as I asked why, from then on for the next X number of years it was just one thing after another one answer after another one answer that I didn't want after another I mean, I, uh, I knew exactly what happened at the Battle of the Boyne. It was James and William, Protestant, Catholic. For my six-year-old, I, I knew there was something else. I mean, they don't know why. So I knew yeah. from a six-year-old there was something. I was just looking at these amazing banners and bands and thinking, what is this about? Uh, and, and 50 years later, got the answer. Got the answer. Yeah, which yeah. Was, it's a, it was a battle, all right, but it was a ritual battle. But yeah. and it happened near these amazing structures. There wasn't only one, there's three amazing structures down there. North, South, Newgrange. Funnily enough, in Giza Plateau, there's three pyramids. But of course, the ones at Newgrange are 500 years, 500 years older than the ones in Giza, in Egypt. Right, so these predate the, pyram the pyramids of Giza by 500 at least, years. At least 500 years. And these two guys picked this spot. This was a bad place for having this kind of a battle. Explain that a little bit, why it's so, so, so weird militarily. It's really detailed because James met Schomburg up around Dundalk area. And that was the place, it's called the, the Gap of the North, actually where Cacullion was supposed to hold off the men of Ireland on his own. But this was the place to hold a battle for James. The worst place he could have picked was at the Boyne River. He was completely open. He, he had no territorial advantages no, working no, in his no, favour. No. Yeah. No. So already we're on to something a little bit suspicious. Let, let's come back to some more of that. But we know there's maybe mm. something dodgy about why they picked this place. So these structures, do we know who built them? Or what is the accepted view at the moment mm. of who built these structures? Well, the accepted view is it was uh, a people called the Grover people. Nathan Lamas calls them the Watchers. Mm -hmm. They're mentioned in the Book of Enoch, for instance. So we've got some something in history that says, yeah, Enoch was there. And Enoch is one of the patriarchs of the Old Testament as well, of course. Right. And one of the things that is mistakenly, it now turns out, due to your research, said about Newgrange is that it is one of the best preserved burial chambers in Europe. Uh, yeah. And boy, have they got that wrong. Yeah, that's nonsense. The basis on, on finding some powder, and now uh, Lawrence Gardner has a different view of what this powder is, mm -hmm. uh, which, which is found in the pyramids as well. But it was just assumed that this was uh, cremations put in, uh, and there's three amazing basins in, within Ukraine. Uh, so they found uh, dust. So they said, well, it was a burial chamber. Now, I suppose there's nothing to stop later people uh, burying people in it. 
using but it. But certainly it wasn't built mm -hmm. for that purpose. No, and even the alignment of this structure uh, gives the game away because you go down a very long passageway uh, down which it's very hard to see directly mm. but somehow the light of the rising sun on the winter solstice manages to penetrate down this long entrance chamber and into an open space at mm. the centre of the structure. Just talk me through the three different alcoves which we have at the end of that long passageway and what the sun did. Well in mid midwinter if it's a good day, if it's cloudless sky, the sun will shine in what they call the roof box. It hits the ground like a laser beam and travels up into the centre. The basins that's in the, the left and the right alcoves were brought out into the middle. Mm -hmm. So when the sun hit the first one, which is plain, which comes from the left alcove, and on the back wall of the left alcove, there's a face of a baby. Quite hard to see, but it, it, it definitely is there. Sun hits the first one. This is the sun, the god, coming onto the earth, making the, the earth fertile. So it hits the first one, which is plain, and turns it into exactly what happens in the fertility cycle. There's two nuclei on the second basin, exactly the same that happens in, inside a woman's womb. And the third basin? And the third basin is in six pieces. The six pieces is called the six stage embryo. Okay, on these stone artifacts, there is something that shows the penetration of the ovum by the sperm, yeah. uh, followed by an immediate cell division, followed by another depicting mm. Yeah, they knew about genetics. They knew about Obviously, genetics. Obviously, because there it is in stone. The evidence is there, it's in stone. And if you go down there this December 22nd, mm. it's going to happen again. Yeah. Because the orientation of, of this roof slot through which the sun comes takes account of the precession yeah. of the equinoxes. Yeah. And yeah, so it's a, yeah. it, it knows about mm -hmm. what's going to happen to the position of the mm -hmm. sun and the solar system in the, in the galaxy over the course of a mm -hmm. few thousand years, and that's calculated into the way it's built. Yeah. So these guys also knew about astronomy. Yeah, and so they would have known about the comet coming in the solar system. Which is to jump out to something else. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, you're, you're, but, but the, the yeah. strange thing is, I mean, I've seen an argument, a very convincing argument, that New Grange was, was built in 600 BC. Uh, and I went into this and researched it. For me, it turned out that it's when they came back to Ireland, the fine New Grange, as we call it now, it was called at one time an Irish Cave of the Sun. It was collapsed at this stage. And they rebuilt it. But they rebuilt it as a memorial to the birthplace of humanity. And that's why it's a museum type place. Now, before that, four or five thousand years ago, it was a completely different structure. So that accounts for the, the, the argument that it was 600 BC, you know, because there was it was rebuilt at that stage. Okay. But four thousand years ago, it was a, a different structure altogether. We'll get back to that yeah. in a minute as to what would cause you to go and then return. Yeah. But we're clearly dealing with a, an advanced civilization here because of their knowledge. My theories were they could actually stand and look up in the sky and see these massive planets because the whole solar system was, was different than it is today. The planets were much closer. Hence, you, uh, in Nath, for instance, there's a map of the surface of the moon. Well, I think it could do that because they were so close to it. The scale of the solar system was actually smaller and more concentrated at yeah. that time. Give it all, but you call that <laughs> David Talbot yeah, has made a video uh, remembering the end of the world, right? Which is is a, is a must if, if you want to understand what's going on. There's an interesting geographical correspondence as well between the shape of the River Boyne in Ireland as it flows to the sea and the curves it makes, and the the, the curves taken by the Nile as mm. it progresses out to the sea. Mm. You can overlay the two. Yeah, and not only could you overlay the two, but you could put the Milky Way on top of both of them. That bend on the Boyne, which is called Burna Boyne, is the same as the bend on the Nile. And where we get that bend, just up from it, is uh, a place called Akhenaten, built by Akhenaten. Mm -hmm. And on the Boyne, we get slain in the same place, for instance. So we've got a river in Egypt, and we've got a river in Ireland, 
and the two of them I mean it's astonishing geographically mm -hmm. alone that two rivers have identical shapes yeah. etc but no, we yeah. also have these ancient structures near both rivers in yeah. similar places and yet the one that's in Ireland is 500 years mm -hmm. or more before the one that's in Egypt yeah we have to take a look at what it was that happened to the people who built what is called Newgrange, or as I think you named it there, the, uh, the other name, the Cave of the Sun. And that's where we come into the issue of the size of the solar system and work which has been touched on by people is like Velikovsky, mm. which is the, the catastrophic impact of major solar system changes on Earth. Around about when, Andy? 5,000 years ago, give or take a few hundred years. Uh, but in Bournemouth at that stage, or that area, which was wasn't called Ireland at the time, obviously, and it was a much much bigger area. They lived an advanced race of people. These people were twelve to sixteen feet high, and the perfect example of hu humanity. They'd reached their full potential. They were able to do this because the Earth at that stage was in a membrane. A membrane of water was around the Earth, and. That kept the, the harmful rays of the sun from get, getting through. So you're talking about a time then when the earth itself was not inclined no. in, in the way it is now and therefore no. the, the, the climate was, hey, it sounds mm. like the Garden of Eden, the climate mm. was a tropical or yeah. a subtropical climate all mm. over the earth. Yeah. The planets were all closer Yeah. and there was a membrane. Mm. So that membrane was a vapour membrane. Yeah. And uh, what happened? They were able to see that there was comet coming. You see a lot of clues to this in the Book of Enoch. And that's why Enoch was brought by the, the angel Uriel to Bjornaboyne to build this structure. Now, for my money, this structure that was built in Uga, it was much bigger than it is today. Mm -hmm. But my contention is that Newgrange at that stage call it Noah's Ark. That's Noah's Ark. There's a great play, I think, in the Bible where it says that Noah's Ark came to rest in Mount Ararat. Well, if you spell Mount Ar Ararat backwards, you get Tara Ra. Ra. Tara is at the other end of the valley where the hill of Tara is. I think the whole valley is called, was called Tara at one stage. And the hill of Tara, in Tara or of Tara was, was there as well. But Tara means a, a house, it can mean a house, a palace. Mm -hmm. right. So Ra is obviously a sun. So we'll have the, the house of the sun, God. Ra. Tara Ra. New, new Grange. What we call it today New Ra -ra. Tara Ra. Ra. If you spell it backwards, it comes out Tara Ra. Ara Ra. Yeah. And these guys were like, I mean, they were very symbolic. And it. So therefore, what was the Ark? They were protecting themselves from the, the comet that was coming in. They were trying to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't only here. I mean, there's one something similar to New Grange in France. And there's one in Scotland. My contention is there was 10, at that stage there was 10 provinces in a big island. One island where like Ireland and England were joined, England was joined the parts of the continent, which made one big island. Mm -hmm. I tried to keep away from Atlantis because it was done to death and I didn't really want to get into it. But you can't get away from it. You can call it Atlantis if you want, hey, hey Brazil. But it was a big island and there was 10 provinces on it according to Plato and the ten princes. Yeah, which puts an entirely different complexion on the phrase brought in the animals two by two because the two by two here then would refer to genetics, it would refer to the four building blocks of DNA. the DNA. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you were able to bring every sort of animal in there instead of having them all in there physically. So there are varying accounts and interpretations of what actually occurred uh, when the comet came in. That would have virtually almost wiped out civilization. It did. Yeah. There was very few left. I mean, well, I think when they came out of the arcs, arcs, the plural, was I think it was more than one. I think it was about at least ten. The question is this, where did the water come into all this? Because, of course, the flood is in yeah. every legend of almost every mm. people. Came uh, from the membrane. Came in from the membrane. You know, it's, because again it says it in Genesis, the water above the earth. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a deluge. It wasn't just the a rainfall, there was a deluge, and the water above the earth came down, opened windows in the sky. So I tend to think that was the, the membrane around the earth. The comet of the meter didn't have to hit the earth, 
But I think the Earth at that stage went through the, the tail of the comet, and this is where you, in fact, I think it's where all religions come from, because this war in the sky between the gods, the one rocks at each other. And yeah, because there's something else that we've got to factor into this too, and that is that w what we may be witnessing in that terrible catastrophe, as far as the people of the time were concerned, was actually a death rebirth event. Yeah for the civilization, for the human spirit at the time, and that the human spirit that existed at that time was not the kind of consciousness which we know today. We'll pick that right up. You're on the next level on BreakForNews.com, and we will be right back. Welcome back. This is The Next Level on BreakingNews.com and we're continuing our discussion about, it seems, not just the history, the unknown history of both Newgrange and those megalithic sites in Ireland and the Battle of the Boyne and the worlds in collision issues raised by Velikovsky. Irvin, you were making a good point during the break about Newgrange uh, in terms of water. Newgrange itself as a structure is totally sealed. It, it is watertight, as you're being shown around. The guides invariably make this statement to everyone there each time that it is a total watertight chamber. When you consider also that the, the actual stones inside, th there's no cement, there's no mortar used. Uh, they, these, these fit into place. Yeah. And for something to do that, to make it watertight, is, is quite an achievement. Isn't it just? So we're talking about then this civilization, and they'd never be the same again, would they? You know, I mean, whatever was left of them, which was very few. When you come out of, of the Noah's Arks, you come out to a, a nuclear winter. Mm -hmm. Their sun was gone, so they set off south looking for the sun. And they, they called it the Son of God. And their saviour would return someday and, and save them. And this, this is the birth of religion, Right, I think. Right, so this is the symbol structure, which then later becomes the core of of the religious structures. Yeah, yeah. and uh, 
not only was it like the end of life as they knew it, mm. uh, the end of the world virtually yeah. for them, uh, in a physical sense, presenting tremendous challenges to attempt to survive this event, but also in a psychological way. And this is something that has been explored, and you, you uh, deal with the issue in your book, the bicameral mind. Mm. In other words, what kind of a mind did these people have? Just bring us up to date on that, Andy. Bicameral mind was, was discovered by uh, Dr. Julian James of Princeton University. The origin of consciousness in the breakdown of the bicameral yeah. mind. Yeah. yeah. This is an article by Dr. Frank Wa- R. Wallace, Consciousness, the End of False Authority. And just to, to give you a quote out of it, Dr. James discovered that until 3,000 years ago, essentially all human beings were void of consciousness. Man, along with other primates, functioned by mimicked or learned reactions. But because of his much larger, more complex brain, Mom was able to develop a coherent language beginning about 8000 BC. That's a good introduction, I think, to you know, what the bicameral mind is. It's a two cham- bicameral means two chambered, mm-hmm. uh, the right and the left brain. Uh, the right brain was known as the god brain, as the god part of the brain, and the left side was the man brain. And this is what I think we get in, in the Old Testament Mo- Moses talking to God, for instance. It, because he could, it was hallucinated. He's talking to the God in his own head. Exactly. Uh, he's talking to him. Yeah. yeah. But the God would tell him exactly what to do, super intelligently. I mean, everything he needed to know, this was communicated to them by the right side of the brain because they didn't have consciousness in between to sort of slow the whole process up. Much it's like driving, mm-hmm. you know, when you're, when you're learning to drive. Uh, at first, you're all over the place because you're trying to. Your brain's trying to give you directions yeah. for everything consciously, but once you learn it, then it becomes automatic. It's automatic, yeah. which is an interesting word, automatic. So it has the potential to be unconscious, yeah. but at the same time, this isn't stupid. I'm not sure sometimes if I'm running them down when we say they were unconscious. Mm. That is that a bad thing or a good thing? Mm. It's, I think when we think of unconscious, we think we're asleep. And we think when we're walking about doing things every day, we're conscious. And we're not. Most of the time, we're, we, we just do things unconsciously. Like, I mean, if you, again, if you're driving along and all of a sudden you think, wow, what happened there? I've drove 10 miles and I haven't a clue I, you know, how I've done it. Or, and we don't know. even have to think about walking. Exactly. We, we decide to go from A to B and all the rest yeah. of the stuff happens yeah. automatically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like that. But that's as close as we can get to We can never, ever tell what, what a bicameral man was actually like. So not a stupid mind by any means. No, very intelligent mind because James again uh, shows in his book how genius can work if you like mm-hmm. without having consciousness getting in the way. And so it's possible that these people had actually through intuition mm-hmm. and and uh, through their connectedness with nature had invented and, and perfected a totally integrated human planet friendly technology system yeah and tor- towards the end of that uh, you, you'll see it in the Old Testament as you come to the end of the Old Testament that whole changeover that breakdown uh, and what actually happens during the breakdown of that about the gods disappearing when they were at their, their peak the bicameral civilization, I mean, uh, that was to me a, a garden of Eden because they had no decisions to make at all on this beautiful planet with the beautiful weather system in it and never having to make a, a decision for themselves because all decisions were made for them because it was the voice of God that then told them exactly what to do and this is the voice of authority and that's the major indication today of the big camera mind which is politics if you like and religion always looking for the voice of authority which we've lost a long time ago that's starting to make sense mm. Garden of Eden in other words they ate of the fruit of the tree, of, of the knowledge of, of good knowledge. and evil, yeah. of having to make your own decisions and screw-ups. Yeah. Uh, in other words, an independent consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. This, is the, this is the early stages of what um, Jung described as individuation. Mm. We're nearly like a hive in that idyllic world. And mm. this catastrophic Super. event was a complete mental breakdown mm. for these people, as well as a, a civilization breakdown. Yeah. And yet, mm. self-consciousness, self-awareness... Yeah were to come out of this catastrophic event. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where well, man can actually debate with himself at this stage, oh, come into this stage, mm-hmm. it's like a proto-consciousness uh, almost, just before the consciousness we know today, where we can debate, where we can f- conceptualise, which they couldn't do, 
Yes. You know, or metaphorise, which they couldn't do. They just done things. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, and they built pyramids. But for instance, if you look at the pyramids, you know, amazing structures built by geniuses. But they're blocks. They're blocks set on top of each other, basically. But if you look at the skyline of New York, for instance, you can see the difference between the conscious mind and the bicameral mind. Yes. For instance. Or look at the chaos under the hood of a Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. But everything working together, you know, made by a conscious mind, where the bicameral mind was completely different. But they, in, in their category, reached the very pinnacle of their civilization before it was destroyed, like a Garden of Eden. Uh, after after it was destroyed, and they were looking for their gods again, obviously some became more conscious than others. So they formed, and they became a voice of God, this authority for, for the people who mm -hmm. were looking for gods anyway. Mm -hmm. So they built godhouses, where God was taken outside of the human being now, and he was put on the cloud. And he was also uh, grabbed hold of, or the god function yeah. was uh, commandeered yeah. by humans who figured that they would make all the decisions mm. for the Helping. for the masses uh, and so mm. we see that continuing today in the mm. political structures yeah but it but it is breaking down mm. now this uh, substitute so the bicameral mind is still in the process of recovery essentially yeah. attempting to rebuild its psyche in mm. a new consciousness yeah. even as we speak today exactly but for them, the journey to recovery was a simple one of survival initially. Mm, With the nuclear so. winter ruling in the Northern Hemisphere, they had to go south, mm. follow, find the sun again. Well, their son, yeah, the son of God, uh, come back. And, and, and they would have made that trip, if, if we're right about the positioning of the ancient civilization in Ibernia, Hibernia, mm. or what is sometimes called At Atlantis mm. or High Brazil mm. and all the legendary names yeah. in this northern, west, northwestern corner of Europe. They would have trekked across Europe mm to get down and get south. Yeah. It's important to remember it came from 10 provinces because mm -hmm. that'll be important later. Right. And so where did they end up? At the very centre of the earth, of the landmass of the earth, because you bring the landmass of the earth together now. Giza. Where they were to find themselves by the banks of a river similarly shaped to that one back in Ireland <laughs> yeah. today yeah. and where they would erect these massive structures with the same knowledge mm. of astronomical movements mm. which are demonstrated in the Irish yeah. structures which predated them. Yeah, but don't forget, 500 years later. So they must have progressed in their building skills, yes. obviously, a bit more complex. Yeah. Speaking of which, Newgrange, does it have anything pyramidical about it or did it ever? Oh, it did at one stage. Yeah, there was, in fact, there was three pyramids shaped stones outside it. Some people say that at one stage it was in a pyramidal shape. Uh, I don't know about that. But there was three pyramid type rocks or stones outside it as like, you know, just standing stones. Standing stones. And they were taken away for some reason. Right. It was too much of a, a clay or something. Where these guys came from or where <laughs> they went to. <laughs> uh, which is the same thing. They went there and they came back from there. And now we're dealing with an Egyptian civilization and then that begins to intersect with a Judaic culture mm. so which may have come indeed out of the Egyptian tradition let's just take a look at all of that mm. some of it is some people will be familiar with some of that already yeah. in terms of uh, the Israelites having come out of Egypt in the first mm. place the question is uh, were they just temporary guests or are we in fact describing another movement out of that Egyptian culture I think they went in, and, and there's plenty of evidence for people coming from the north going into Egypt. These, uh, it's a mystery school called the, the Atlantean tribes mm -hmm. who, who went into Egypt. Now, sort of seen in uh, Thut Thutmose III, Third. Uh, who was the founder, or the traditional founder of the mystery schools mm -hmm. in Egypt. So these tribes came into Egypt built this civilization but I mean it was a mystery for a long time I think it's still a mystery to some people how in Egypt this civilization came in already made yeah it came in already made because it came from the north you know yeah. these uh, Aryan it could be called Aryan nothing to do with with the, the later Aryan nothing to do with our racial Aryan triumphalism no. No. in fact it's hard it, it may not even be Aryan as it was hijacked this is a different kind yeah. of Aryan. We're talking about a Scandinavian Aryan yeah. 
Um, we're talking about in many cases you still see in the west of Ireland fair skin, red hair, yeah, yeah. large stature. Mm. That's the kind mm. of area we're talking about. Yeah, and you'll see this in, in most of the mummies. Yes, they, they find that it's from like four thousand BC. You see that there some of them are white skin, red hair. Uh, but getting back to the, the tribes, the Atlantean tribes who came into Egypt uh, with the civilization and, and added to that, built uh, uh, the uh, Egyptian golden age, if you like. But then the priesthood moved in and tried to take over this this knowledge or, or use it for, for their own ends. And then mm. we see the, the tribes moving out of Egypt because they didn't want that to happen and taking the knowledge with them. These tri tribes are, we know today, Israel, it's IS, represents Isis, RA, RA represents the sun god Ra, Ra, and EL represents, well, it, 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 yeah, it's a, a god, but it's almost like a trinity again. And then we see this, both esoteric and spiritual knowledge, we see its presence all the way from Egypt and across the mountains into the Himalayas and up into Tibet. Yeah, where we find Tartan Basin mummies. 4,000 year old mummies who were wearing tartan, who were red hair, the blonde hair, blue eyed. You're kidding. You know, they found in, in northern China, in one of the remote provinces, they found these, these uh, mummies. And they were, as I say, wearing tartan. And and they were red hairs. Still had the red hair. Uh, what was the movie? Mel? It was full of tartans and kilts. Mm. Mel Gibson and Braveheart. So you're talking mummies with kilts here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Indo-European. Mm. Meanwhile, back over in Ireland, James on one side of the river mm. and William on the other side of the river are patiently waiting mm. for us to conclude our Egyptian journey so that we can yeah. explain to people why it is that these two guys are on the yeah. opposite sides of the river in 1690, so many years yeah. later. But we're, don't worry, folks, we haven't forgotten the two of them. They're still <laughs> waiting there to go start back. the battle. <laughs> you just go back to Egypt. You were saying earlier about Akhenaten. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there's a book called Kingdom of the Ark, and then that, that's where I first came across this theory about Akhenaten's daughter named Scotia, or Scotta, who left the the fall of Akhenaten's reign and went to Spain with with her followers, and and on into Europe, and and founded a place uh, called Scythia, and these were the original Scots Irish. I'm sure some people are saying, OK, I'm hanging in there through the Vel Velikovsky worlds mm. in collision, the migration down to Egypt. But I dare you to really connect this back to James and William on the opposite mm. sides of the Boyne mm. in 1690 <laughs> and make that relevant to the question. Well, yes, yeah, so I'll have to tell you first my theory about why it was there in the first place, why the battle ritual. It was to put a code onto the landscape to show our true history. For instance, when the sun rose, it rose at 4 a.m., William... And the sun is always orange when it rises. Yes. And, it, and it's called Horus and the Horus Rising, or Horizon. That's where Horizon, the word comes, horizon from, yeah. comes from. That, yeah. and, and William, obviously, on his white horse, well, his white horse is always a symbol of a sun god. And if you go right back through Egypt, back to Ireland, the other way, you get a solar religion the whole way around. This is a solar ritual as opposed to a lunar ritual, which he was sort of taken over from James. And so you had the sun rising at 4 a.m. You had William rising in Malifant Abbey, because that's where he had his headquarters, at 4 a.m. The first shots were fired at 8 a.m. And if you look at the banks of the boy, William was there at 8 a.m. with his officers. Mm -hmm. You imagine a, a, this colourful group just arriving at, at the boy at 8 a.m. when the first shots were supposedly fired. If you look at the banks of the Milky Way, You'll see another colourful group there, Aces, Mars, and, and a couple of others. And it's only when Mars actually comes over the horizon at 8 a.m. that the battle begins. Right, so the battle's beginning when Mars comes over the horizon. Because at 12 o'clock, for instance, uh, Horus, again, is a sun god. Is, that, is, that, is on a high. <laughs> But he's also in the middle of the Milky Way. The Milky Way. At 12 o'clock, according to history, William is on his white horse in the middle of the Boyne River. Right. Yeah. So it's it a bit of a coincidence there, to say the least. And James, obviously, James is representing set, which in sunset. 
like the darkness. Yes. He is in uh, Donor Abbey, which gives another clue because the both of them are on Maker Headquarters in Holy Ground. Yes. James in the churchyard and William in the Abbey, well, from Abbey, which was an old Templar Abbey. Okay, let's say Cistercian Abbey, but you, you get Cistercian in the stroke. Templar. Templar overlay, yeah. 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 So when William gets sort of uh, Horace in the sky, gets the Milky Way, James retreats. It's James never fired a shot. Another, oh, there's just so many clues. Another clue is William wouldn't fight on a Monday. Now they said it was because of a superstition, but if he'd have fought on the Monday, it would have been a lunar ritual, and he was taking the the, the uh, lunar over or pushing the right to bring in the solar worship. So he fought on a Tuesday, which was was equal equates with it's the same day as Mars, the god of war. I like you, Irvin, to bring out that story about the, the planetarium. What was the idea of going to the planetarium and what happened? It was to see, the, the basically, to confirm the theory of where we believed the sun, the sun the plus the planets would be at a certain time of the day uh, to correspond with what, what was taking place on the ground. And uh, it, it just matched perfectly. Mm. You know, so you went to the, there's a planetarium up mm. in... The, uh, yeah, in Armagh. Mm-hmm. And uh, the river pulled up a, a sky map. Mm. He actually pulled yeah, up got our sky. He, yeah, he pulled it actually up for the date too, for the first of July. Yeah, well, I can. I mean, yeah. I I got the program afterwards, the same program, so I could use it on the computer mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and do it in more detail. You know, so I didn't have to use watch it once. I could watch it again and again, and print print out and that's in the book. Yeah, print offs in the book. Okay. I also like to bring out about the uh, unicorn and the lion. I have a sky map, and if I looked at the sky map on my computer, I could see on the left-hand side of the sky, the star system Leo. Mm -hmm. On the right-hand side, at the other side, practically, of the Milky Way, is the star system Monoceros. Monoceros means one-horned, and it's represented by the unicorn. Unicorn. So on the right right bank, you have the unicorn. On the left bank, you have the lion. The lion, of course, is, is the symbol of a Scots and James's House of Stuart. Yes. And the unicorn is the the symbol of the Israelis and the and the Scots. Also, if you look at the British coat of arms, you've got these two symbols at this at each side of the coat of arms, the lion and the unicorn. And above that you've got the little lion, little Leo, and we've got that in the sky as well on that morning. Just above Leo, you've got Leo Minor, Little Lion, and you've got the Little Lion on the coat of arms. Just below that, you've got uh, Cancer the Crab. Mm -hmm. And if you look in the book, there's a picture in the book of the British coat of arms. The symbol there just looks like a crab. Okay, so this is getting very real now. Because you're tying in that celestial knowledge mm. of, of what's in the sky, which you have to know about in order to stage manage these events, mm. which took place on the plains mm. of Meath, on either side of the River Boyne. You have, in the British coat of arms, the lion and the unicorn, mm. and the little Leo, and what looks like the crab. Mm. And you have William and James lined up on the opposite sides of the banks of the Boyne, which represents the Milky Way. Yeah and which was positioned in the sky with the lion and unicorn on the opposite. It's starting to make sense, you're starting to tie it all in. Well, I mean, it's so obvious. When you do the research, it's just so obvious what's happened. Now, there's a technical name for the British Coat of Arms, but when we say the British Coat of Arms, everybody knows what we're talking about. They came together in 1601, when James, the uh, sixth of Scotland, the first of England, came to the throne, and was the first Stuart King of Britain and Ireland. And that leads on the whole new story about the Stuarts and who they were and how they were mixed up with the Masons because James is repeatedly the one to bring uh, the Masonic type teachings into England. I said earlier on about the Stuarts and the House of Stuart and the House of Orange being closely linked and they are. According to Lawrence Gardner, the House of Stuart is also known as the House of Unicorn and here we have William. Uh, uh, we didn't bring it out before. It was said William was in one bank. He's betrayed in, uh, on most of the gable walls in Belfast, for instance, going across on his white charger, though he never rode a white charger, it was a brown one, with the sword over the horse's head. And if you can visualise that, a sword over the horse's head. It's okay. like a unicorn. It's a unicorn. 
and on its rump there's an X. And again, according to Lawrence Gardner, this is the, the Scottish Psalter of, of St Andrew that represents the male and the female. And it gets back again to the House of Unicorns, the Stuart, because don't forget William was an actual Stuart, although he was bloodline, although he's off a House of, of Orange, because his mother was Mary Stuart and his wife was Mary Stuart. He was a Stuart, bloodline wise, but not off the House of, of Stuart. And this is one of the reasons why he had to go to the Boyne. Because most researchers, or one in particular says, he became a king at the Boyne. And he actually did. Mm-hmm. Because he couldn't be a, he couldn't really rule uh, as a king until he went through this initiation. Because it was Mary of the House of Stuart who the seven wanted to rule as William as her consort. She wouldn't have it. It had to be a, a joint rule, which was the first one ever. Uh, but William knew because of the occult uh, knowledge that they had, that he had to become a Horus King, because a Horus King goes over everything. Right, so this can, this can then explain some of the seemingly inexplicable military manoeuvres of James in exactly. relation to the battle, etc. These guys are playing a, a, an extraordinarily ancient ritual. Mm. Let's pick that up after another break. You're on the next level of breakfornews.com. <laughs> and we're... Uh, <laughs> We're blowing your mind, I hope. (laughs) And we'll be back to blow it some more in just a moment. level on breakfornews.com and we're starting to use words now like mason and we're talking about esoteric knowledge so this in its own right is taking us back to egypt anyway Mm. and then we can trace the return of these peoples back to the ancient lands to rebuild in around 600 bc that was a a quest to return to the homeland do you figure andy this was what was driving that as well as perhaps a political dissatisfaction with the hijacking of the authority system by the priest caste in, yeah, in, Egypt. in Egypt. Yeah, but there's always this this thing. I mean, you know, when the Irish go to America, 
the, you know, they can't get out of Ireland quick enough and then they, they sing for the rest of their lives about going back there. <laughs> I think it's the same thing. And it, isn't it always this a yearning, thing in, yes. yearning in, in us to go back to their homeland? And I think it, they were no different. They wanted to go back to their homeland. And at this stage, they had nowhere to go because we're, we're told in the Bible, for instance, they were wandering in the desert for 40 years. Although 40 means, in the Bible, means a, a perfect time. Yes. So they were wandering in the desert. There's nowhere else to go. So they headed north back to their, their original country. When we hear of Moses communing with God on the top of the mountain, uh, essentially what Moses was saying to the people in this new era of the loss of the voices was mm. he could reconnect them yeah. with the voice of the mm. God. He would hear it mm. and he would commune with it and yeah. then he would bring that knowledge to them. Mm. So uh, this was a people who now had to rely on others mm. in order to communicate the authority. Yeah. And, and so we had the potential for hijacking. And we had mm. the potential for this knowledge of what the original system was to be kept secret mm. for maybe beneficial reasons because it was sacred knowledge but also yeah. potentially for malign reasons. Mm. They left their mark too on Europe as they came back over. Yeah. They may indeed have uh, hung about a bit in Denmark mm. for a while before yeah. they came back, if we look at the name there. Tribe of Dan. Tribe of Dan, yes. Dan and, uh, and we can see other indications across Europe of this return mm. as these peoples came back also. Yeah, the Danube. The Danube. For instance. That's one of the ways they came back. Skoda, Scotia, and her people sailed back because they were Phoenician descendants, great sailors. So they sailed back to Ireland. There's other ones went through Europe, through Scath what was called Scathia at the time they found it Scathia. But as soon as enough Scathia then becomes Casaria, which was a great civilization for uh, five hundred years mm -hmm. and probably saved Europe from the Arab invasion when Martel was was fighting the Arabs and Byzantium, uh, the south of France, the Kassarians were holding up the eastern wing of the, like, uh, of the Arabs, yeah. and they fought them for over a hundred years. And as well as these migrations of population mm. back to the ancestral homeland, yeah. we also had the encapsulation of the esoteric knowledge, and there are words that are bandied about lightly, the Masonic, Illuminati, for mm. example, taking it right back to its roots, it seems to come back to its roots in Atanakan and mm. the Rosicrucian order. I mean, that's the, mm. the, the root of esoteric knowledge, isn't it? Well, the, the Egyptian mystery schools. Yes. That's where it, uh, it found a home, I think. I think the root of it actually comes back to Ireland, <laughs> or what was called Ireland at that, that stage. That, that's the real root. That's where solar, the solar religion came from. It went into Egypt. Yes. And, and they found that the mystery schools then moved out of Egypt with the Israelite tribes, apparently. There was a great split at one stage with the House of Israel and the House of Judah split into ten and two, two and a half tribes and ten tribes. And as I say, one of them went up through Caesarea and the other one sailed into Ireland, the Scotia and her, her sons mm -hmm. and Caledonia. And, and eventually when Fergus took his tribes over to Scotland, it became the land of the Scots again. And so it was, became Scotland. These opposing armies, which are so close to each other in bloodline, mm. and their esoteric knowledge, which they are demonstrating by the ritual they're enacting in mm. the battle, how do they line up on opposite sides of that bank, forces of the Vatican and the forces of the Reformation yeah. Yeah. lined up against each mm. other? What currents do those two forces represent? How do we trace those, ba those two currents back politically? House of Stuart... Uh, can be traced back to Egypt. Right. The House of Orange is traced back to the south of France. Okay. So south of France being an interesting place because yeah, it was the, a seat of opposition to to the to Vatican rule. Yeah. Because it Orange. Yes. Is, is, is where the house came from, not the bloodline. The House of Orange came from Orange in the south of France. Yeah, and you've got a nice focus as well too, is that you're pointing out that the houses, in fact, may be a more accurate representation of the power structures than the bloodlines, yeah. or, although the bloodlines may track mm. and mirror the, the power in the houses. Yeah. This is, could be one of the reasons Diana was married into the House of Windsor. 
Because uh, so Flynn's are is they're usurpers. It's a usurper. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. I think a lot of people not, are aware of that. Not yeah. now, they're not because Diana married into them and we've got Prince William, who's a steward. Who is a steward. Yeah, because Diana so, was a steward according to So there may be an analogous political theatre being played out mm. at the Battle of the Boyne. Oh yeah. Where where um what we're seeing is a is a is a power shift. Mm. But it's not really maybe a power shift. It's a change in emphasis. It's a slight change in bloodline. Mm. It's a legitimization of a of a new entrant, mm. William. There's also a lot of change goes on. Major change goes on at the at the same time mm -hmm. because you've you've got democracy coming on this scene. You've, for instance, William, Prince of Art, his friend was John Locke, right? A great uh, objectivist. They wrote a, uh, two theories of civil government, for instance. In fact, it was against the uh, divinity of the king. You know, where the Stuarts believed they were divinely divine kings. Mm -hmm. William didn't. William was becoming more a man of the people, if you like. This yes. is where, where it got um, constitutional monarchy from. Yeah, and, and uh, the word bicameral, of course, comes up in a political context because a bicameral political structure is one where you have this division, like the Senate and the House mm -hmm. in yeah. the United States or the House of Lords and the House of Parliament yeah. in the United Kingdom. And we're also looking at the genesis of what was to become uh, the foundation of that great document of individual conscience, which is the Constitution of the United States, which, you know, h here am I raised as a Catholic, right? Thank God for the Protestant Reformation. Mm. My God. <laughs> so we're seeing uh, battles mm. of, of authority. Yeah. Uh, and the kinds of authority that rule taking place here. But if you look from my point of view, I mean, I didn't want to bring up all this. I, I tried to keep above the political, if, if you like. All I was doing was making my research available or, or laying out. And so, oh, look, this is what I find. It's trying to not make up political. I think a book is very well balanced in this regard. Uh, and yet at the same time as you had these... Oh wow! Some religious fervor in them. I mean, just, just oh, yeah. look at the story of Joan of Arc to see how mm. these events could grip nations mm. in the mythic structure which still prevailed mm. in the Europe of its time. They could move people. It was a great catalyst for change. Yes, I mean everything changed after the Battle of the Boyne and the reign of William. The democracy, the, the fiat money system, and he was backed by Jewish bankers. William was because he came from Holland and. Holland was one of the freest countries in Europe at that time who welcomed the Jews and probably the Kisarian bankers came yes. in and they were the ones who were, were back in William as well. Mm. I grew up in uh, the Loyalist area as, as a Protestant and even the parades, the Orange parades, I mean we've got for instance the figure parades in Belfast, I mean Bell itself is, is the uh, god of the ancient Israelis. You're beginning uh, to blow my mind again. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the 12th of July, for instance, we've got these feeder parades, which causes, oh, well, one or two of them causes problems mm -hmm. because they, they go near nationalist areas. Nationalist yeah. areas. And they're seen as triumphalism. But I think that goes even deeper because I think this is uh, almost a race memory or a Jungian uh, unconscious collective memory. Why? Because where does ten feeder parades come up before? Yeah, the ten provinces of Atlantis. You know, where they came from ten different areas to meet at one stage, which was the great grasslands of, of Europe, of Northern Europe, met there and headed south. This happens every 12th of July. Ten districts come together and head south towards Malone District in, in, in Belfast, mm -hmm. which is south, and again return north. I'm saying at a deeper level, this is a race memory. That what we're also celebrating is this great trek, this great exodus, away from Ibernia, down and, into Egypt, and, and then back, again. back again. You you tell a great story of almost a vision you had of that. What the original mm -hmm. event was that the race memory is of. Well, I was watching, looking at this, wondering about, you know, you know, what am I seeing here? You know, is, where is this all coming from? Then all of a sudden, it was like a hologram uh, about two feet in front of, of my eyes. Where I was in the position of looking down towards these tents, and I just knew it was the tribes of Israel. And there was a, a rider going through on a horse, shouting, get into your tribes, we're going home. 
and it just took me back to the first time I was ever ever in a Northern Lodge walk was with my father when I was, I don't know, about six, seven year old. And we're at what is called the field where the orange men go, uh, listen to speeches and what have you, and then have a rest stop and then come home again. But as we were sitting there, this marshal was going about and he was shouting, get into your lodges, we're going home. And I just knew then, this is what this is. Yeah, this, it's you race know, memory. It, oh, it's yeah. just a race memory. Uh, okay, right. For those uh, people who are, are very familiar with the surface level of what the marsh is all about and participate in the tradition of it, and they're going, ah, oh, no, hold on, get a grip here, Andy. Mm -hmm. This was about a battle. We yeah. fought a battle, and that's all it was all about. Did you fight a battle? Because if you fought a battle, there should be a bit of uh, military debris around. Yeah. Let's start doing some reality checks just to confirm that you are on the right tracks. Mm -hmm. Because you know of research that's been done down at the Battle of the Boyne site mm -hmm. to look for shot yeah. cannon. And yeah. what have they found? Well, I just happened to run across this guy who does not his name mentioned, uh, who was a member of a metal detecting club. Mm -hmm. And I got a note out of his notebook and it read, uh, useless, not even a musket ball, something not right here. James's camp at Denor, church, useless. If there was a battle here, they must have threw stones at each other. <laughs> right. This, this guy, and I'll call him John, uh, it was his ambition to do this area at the Boyne because he wanted to get a cannonballers. Anything. And he's probably done previous battle sites before, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, so he's done, he, uh, he done Down the Hens, the Battle of Down the Hens. And yes. There's another battle he done, which I've seen it, the stuff he had, which was uh, Ben Burb, which took place in 1646. Mm -hmm. and, and then he just so much buttons. Buckles, shot, uh, cannonball, you know, yes. all of that stuff. But at the Battle of Wine, he didn't get anything. I mean, nothing at all. Right. So then, what was, if we can, if you can try and summarise the political movement that was taking place there? They were finessing so that essentially the same structure remained in place but it took on a new face, yeah. it seems to me. Yeah. yeah. Right. Except now it was a different beast. It was a fiat money entity. Mm. And it was the beginning of the new world order. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, it was. And they, I think I said in the book, it was the new world order triumphing over the old, old world, world or the old system. The new system had triumphed because everything about William was new. The bank, democracy, uh, newspapers, all sorts of things came. Yes. Uh, freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. We're left then as we come into the modern era dealing with the implications of the fact that we had James and William acting out this esoteric knowledge and ritual. And so we're now having to deal with the reality that has that continued? And is that going on right now? And is this esoteric level of knowledge still secret and mm. still motivating players, both from a practical political point of view and from an echoes of history point of view, mm. in that people may be both politically scheming in the current situation they find themselves in and also unconsciously reenacting thematic content out of the past. Mm. Um, you could also say that, just to go back to that particular period, mm -hmm. the 17th century, towards the end of the 17th century you had basically a culmination of what started a century before with the Renaissance, where everything was becoming open. Mm -hmm. There was a, a mass movement in scientific achievement, art, everything. It was opening up. That went on through, it, call it esoteric, call it underground, whatever, but it manifested right through that century. That current, that underground current of progression and involvement does continue to the present day. Yeah, and if you look at the, the scientists who are making the breakthroughs yes. at the time, mm, yes. you find that they're linked to the esoteric knowledge exactly. uh, societies all exactly. along. Yeah, and you'll, yeah. you'll see William and James both, both their houses linked to the esoteric. I was checking and I brought, brought out in the book and show where the links between that. Because, he's, for instance, you take William at the, at, at the battle, mm -hmm. he, he got a, an injury in the shoulder and on the lower leg. Well, anybody in the Masons and, and the Orange Order will tell you that their wounds that can be gotten through initiation in, in certain degrees. 
within in these secret orders. And, and he also, William was laid, laid in, in a hollow in the ground to get his dressings thick, applied. Uh, applied. Yeah, yeah. And, and, he, and he came out of there. And it was only then, after he went through these initiations, I mean, that, that's pure mason, uh, Diane going into the hole in the ground and coming out again. And then uh, continue on, on the journey, on the ritual. And it would be terrific if we could consign all this merely to history, these uh, elaborate ritualistic manoeuvres mm. by powerful houses. Yeah. If it wasn't for the fact, as you just pointed out there now, that it seems as if the, the German House of Windsor, the German House renamed the House of Windsor, mm. has um, done a similar mm. kind of a manoeuvre where they've mm. taken in Stuart bloodline, mm. engineered it into the, into the line, some would, some would suspect engineered Diana out yeah. as quick, mm. having, uh, you know, and if that was an ambush for the Stuarts, they, they fell for it, if you know mm. what I mean. Yeah. Uh, and now they've legitimised the house the house of Windsor mm. with Stuart blood. Mm. Mm. So the, the, this is the stuff that just happened back in 1690. The, no, no, these kind of things. I, I to look at how, how our history could be Anybody's history in, in any country in the world over such a long time could be manipulated. So I had to look at that and I came up with a, a chapter called The Parasitical Elite. Fill in the matrix and there you go. <laughs> That's how it was happening. <laughs> you know, we're all plugged into this system and it's a system as opposed, I mean, I, I'd say it's a system opposed to uh, so called conspiracy, for yes. instance. It's a system. That operates and it's operating today. And it operated in 1690. It operated 3,000 years ago. and operated in, in in the palaces of the pharaohs. Yeah, and it came right up from that right into the parasitical elite we have today. Usually found in, in religion and, and politics. Yes, and, and finance. One of the great offshoots of that reformation of that and of the triumph of individual liberty and conscience was the creation of the United States and the creation of the United States Constitution. I mean, that was the principal movement that I would see following out of the Williamite mm. ascendants was this move into the United States and, and, the, uh, and what happened there between Britain and the United States. What's your interpretation of, of, of the esoteric level of what was, what's been going on there and the political? Because the founders of the United States were mostly Masons, mm -hmm. uh, the signers of the Declaration of Independence, quite a few of them were Masons, mm -hmm. for instance. There was a big influx from Ireland. Uh, uh, Paddy McGreevy, for instance, says, it's Irish Parliament Trust.com, uh, said there was 100,000 Irish Presbyterians missing from history who had gone on to, to America and some people think it was more Presbyterians thrown out of per persecuted and left Ireland than there were Roman Catholics mm -hmm. but anyway they got together uh, when they were in America it came the, well the Americans called them Ulster Scots the Scots Irish they called them Ulster Scots and and when they got together out there you got like Davy Crockett and I think it was about 10 or 11 presidents of the United States, all of their Scotsmen. But when they got together, they, they, they threw the, the British out of America. So, or did they? Or did, <laughs> well, <laughs> on a level they did. I mean, history says, says this is what happened. But then again, you've got the whole manipulation of the parasitical elite and the bankers. The most authoritative explanation of this I've seen is by a guy, guy called Steve Bergson. Mm -hmm. Uh, he just knows the system, the debt-based system, back the front, right. and he's just brilliant at it. And uh, and he can show how that everything is manipulated, yeah, and how they can do it so easily. And he, he, man, you get plenty of this on the, the internet anyway. Most of it's a lot of nonsense. Thanks. Yes, and it's very hard to to determine which parts are substantive mm -hmm. and which parts are invented. But what we can say is that we've we've got evidence of this hidden level mm. and we've got a, his, a history that we're unaware of yeah. which is the backdrop and the, one makes no sense without the other yeah uh, and they, they manipulate the bicameral line because they know how it works 
But if you look at this book, uh, uh, an objective, uh, uh, or the evidence I've, I've just came across, and don't forget, I had to fight very hard to accept the, the evidence. Uh, but it was just, it's just, it was there. There's nothing I could do. I just I had to put it out. Well, I would say that if people want to know the secret history of the world, then look at the bottom of the bottom, because it gives so many clues. I'm not saying this is Atlantis because it's been done to death. Uh, but what I'm saying is the elite then, the top echelons, they believed this was Atlantis because they the fashioned their symbols to show that they believed this was Atlantis. Yeah. yeah I mean, if, if you look, for instance, at the, the Pillars of Hercules, <laughs> which is, I think I like. Uh, One of the called, signposts to Atlantis. Well, it's supposed the, to, yeah, the, suppo the yeah, yeah. But they're supposed to be w were at the, the mouth of the Mediterranean. Yeah. There. But there's no pillars there. Well, funny enough, there's pillars in the north of Ireland and Scotland at Scaffa Flow. There's the same pillars, these bolts pillars have been there for thousands of years. Giant's Causeway. The Giant's Causeway yeah. and Staffa Flow. But if you go through them, you go through the pillars and you, you come to the Boyne Valley. But the like of uh, Waddell uh, and Beaumont both say that Hercules can be, f traces of Hercules can be found in Britain. So if that's the case, are these not the pillars of Hercules that you go through to come to Atlantis, which is Ireland? Yeah, which is why, as part of your trip down here this time, uh, Andy and Irvin, that, that you'll be back to the Boyne because it is such a promising area. It's it's like saying that uh, there is a const there is a constant battle going on uh, between light and dark. Whatever is dark must see the light. It must see the light of day. And when that happens, then you have a harmonium, or you have the erotic creation of ignorance, superstition, everything that goes with it. You just have light, and with that you have knowledge, you have involvement. We have only scratched the surface. Yeah, because even mm. as we speak, in the last few days, mainstream media in the United States and New Zealand, around the world, is beginning to report on the discovery of a pyramid in Bosnia, oh, yeah. which was a hill. So yeah. they had this hill outside the town. When I say hill, I mean 2,300 foot high <laughs> hill. It's not a hill at all. It's a massive pyramid. Any chance of any pyramids in the Boyne Valley if we were to dig? <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's one there, yeah. I think there's still one there, yeah. It was found by again, that's, that's future for future reference. <laughs> but I think there's one there. Yeah. I bet you they thought like that over in Bosnia until the day they looked at that hill. Yeah, yeah. They, they built out on their way down. <laughs> they built out on the way here. <laughs> the way, uh, yeah. That was just yeah. practice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but even, even if you look at uh, talking about Ulster, if you look at the flag of Ulster, you, you get uh, the red hand, which is the hand of Sara. If you look at uh, Genesis 37, you'll see the story is the hand of Zara and of of the Israel yeah of the Israelites and the star behind it's the star of David of the house of Judah and yeah. so that's a, another level that you had at the point these two houses reuniting yes something the same as the cloud of ring the two hands the bloodlines uniting so, yeah. uh, so there's different levels that right down from a, a religious battle it's not saying it wasn't but it's it's a lot deeper and that's what's so confusing about it Fenton. Because it can't be, these guys were geniuses. Mm -hmm. It's only them that could do this, actually have a ritual and stamp on the landscape the secret history of the world. You know, it's almost like... Um, um, right in front of everybody's eyes. Yeah, it's almost like a Da Vinci Code and East King Billy in the wine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it was a codex, it was a code. And they were just waiting for somebody to come along who could decode. What, the whole thing. what was actually going on yeah. yeah see through it yeah uh well that's something we've managed to do and once again to emphasize that we have just scratched the surface because it's an, an extraordinary compendium of so much knowledge and so much new research and all put together in a context which makes sense of everything from the great flood to the illuminati and everything in between it's ireland the land of the pharaohs by andrew power aided i know in his work down the years by Irvin James, who's with us here also tonight.
a tremendous achievement for folks. Well, just by the way, this is the first time it's went public. Up until today, it's been friends and family. But it's a page turner. Mm -hmm. It's an absolute page turner. And it's just so astonishing that it all comes into context mm -hmm. in that meeting with the celestial arrangements in the sky overhead mm -hmm. in 1690 between mm -hmm. James and William. That seems it for me. Exactly the same thing was happening <clears throat> in the sky while William was on his journey across the Boyne. Horace was on his journey across the Milky Way. And there it is. It's the mm -hmm. key. And then within a stone's throw of where that key is are these other structures that take us back into the keys, the roots of Western civilization, mm -hmm. and the ongoing battle that continues today for free expression right here on the internet mm -hmm. on the next level on breakfornews.com, where my guests tonight have been Andrew Power and Irvin James. Thank you very much, both of you, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. And we have covered such a great deal in our discussion tonight, but as I said earlier, we still have only skimmed the surface of what's in this astonishing book. The best way I can summarise it personally is that I've read a lot in my time, both on and off the internet, and there are about a half a dozen books in my personal list of must-read books to know what's going on, and this book is immediately ranked among those. Ireland, Land of the Pharaohs by Andrew Power is available at returntotara.com T-A-R-A, Tara, returntotara.com And I do urge you to do yourself a favour and pick up a copy. You can order by credit card for international airmail delivery. And in the light of news coming out just ahead of the publication of this book, of the discovery of two pyramids in Bosnia-Herzegovina, pyramids which seem to be the same kind as found in Mexico, uh, I have a feeling that you haven't heard the last of these issues. Certainly on this show you haven't, because we will be coming back to the issues which Andy and Irvin have been speaking about tonight. But that's it for this edition of The Next Level. I'll be back soon with more, and I do hope that you can take the time to join me then. But in the meantime, for BreakforNews.com, this has been Fenton Dunn reporting. Will you always keep me warm? Hold me safe and away from home. Keep day for night, and as the day fades, burn a candle bright for me. Will you always keep me warm? Home is safe and away from home Keep day from night and as the day fades Burn a candle right for me Walking into the sun Walking into the sun
Oh